And um, I am so happy to be able to introduce Eduardo Bocano, um, the CEO and founder of Mindset Works, uh, the leading provider of growth mindset programs and services. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO um, and founded the company with Carol Dweck, the foremost researcher of growth mindset in 2007. Since then, they have supported thousands of schools and businesses and organizations um, that are looking to advance learner-oriented uh, cultures and systems. Um, before, we, before we get started, I want attendees to keep two things in mind. Uh, one is if we run into any sort of internet or audio connection issues, um, I will let you know and we'll try to get things running smoothly as fast as possible. I'm in North Carolina where internet connection is not always reliable and Eduardo is joining us in California. So we're able to do this miraculously <laughs> right now. Um, and uh, if you are experiencing any audio issues, just private message me in the chat and we can troubleshoot. Um, I just wanna make sure that everyone has the best experience as possible using Zoom today. Um, second, if you have to leave at any point, feel free. Um, the session will be recorded and Eduardo will share his slides. Um, I'll be sending out an email later today with the link to the recording, a copy of the slides and a follow-up survey. Um, and if you have any other logistical questions, either during or after the session, just feel free to email me as well. And with that, I'm gonna have Eduardo take it away. Thanks, Devin. Hi, everybody. Great to be here. Uh, it's, uh, it's really fun to work with a group of people that have a lot of meaning and purpose in their work. So I, I want to start by thanking you for that important work that you do. I see libraries as uh, not just a center in society, but also a center of lifelong learning, uh, which is something that I'm passionate about. So thank you for your important work. Uh, it's also work that you are doing in a complex and fast changing world as 2020 uh, reminds us. Uh, but sometimes we get the impression that all of this change happening this year is something that eventually will stop and change will stop and things will go back to normal. And it's important to remember that change has never stopped before and change will never stop before. Um, and so for me, the question is how can we equip ourselves to be highly adaptable to change, to be able to leverage change so that it makes us stronger. And so we can drive change to, to see the change that we want to see in the world and create that change. And I think that's not something that we need to um, resign ourselves to, but it's something that can enrich our lives. You know, it's like exploring a new book or a new place is, is something that, that can make life more interesting and fulfilling. So our objective for this session today is to advance our ability to navigate cr the crisis and the crisis that we're going through and drive positive change in a complex and fast changing world. And we'll do that by examining something called growth mindset that some of you might be familiar with, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll work to deepen our understanding and, and implications. Uh, we'll look at some structures for learning and how we can create those structures for ourselves and for others and what we can do as a result of all of these. Uh, throughout this session, we're going to make this interactive. One of the ways is through live polling uh, to help us reflect and share our thinking with each other. So I'm going to ask you to open up a browser, whether it's in your computer or in a mobile device and go to this URL, pollev.com slash works. Uh, and you'll see there a question that I want you to answer. Um, and the question is, how do I want my colleagues to perceive me and to think of me? You can see the URL at the top here, uh, paulev.com slash works. I'll put it in, in big font again. Um, and just want you to answer that question. And I'm gonna ask you a couple more questions uh, also before we get started on the content. paulev.com slash works. How do I want my colleagues to perceive me and to think of me? as knowledgeable, as competent, as committed and passionate, as approachable, as competent, great. A kind and capable person, as listening, as reliable, as kind, smart, capable, kind, emotionally intelligent, hardworking, servant leader, wonderful, confident, hardworking, compassionate woman, Friendly, kind, problem solver, collaborator, visionary, supportive, awesome, reliable, benefit to the team. Great. We'll come back to this. 
Second question, for me to get a sense of the group and our prior knowledge, how familiar am I with Carol Dweck's concept of growth mindset? So we see a mix, we see about 15% uh, of us very familiar, 32% somewhat familiar, a quarter of us only a vague sense, and about a third of us have never heard of it. So there's a lot of a wide uh, range of backgrounds. We're gonna work to introduce growth mindset to those who have never heard of it and deepen our understanding of implications and what it is for the rest of us. Um, so the third question, final question before we get started in the content, in my own words, what does growth mindset mean? And if you've never heard of it, I want you to take a wild guess. Anytime we're going through or into a learning experience, it is really fruitful to assess our, our prior understanding before that. It's openness. Open to new ideas, flexible, responsive, lifelong learning, looking at situations as a learning experience, a certain way of thinking that stimulates growth in a variety of facets, willingness to change, openness, ready to adapt, willing and able to change, adapt to changes allowing one's mind to learn new concepts, curious, development potential, being flexible, being open to new things, open-minded, open to feedback, great. So when we ask what a growth mindset is, we often hear a lot of different things like we just saw, and open-minded is one that comes up a lot, um, but we also hear other things that we heard like working hard or persevering, and, and none of these things are a growth mindset. Um, it helps for us to quiz ourselves and what, what our current understanding is so we can compare it to what it actually is and, 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 and explore why, why the definition is important. So as Carol Dweck discovered growth mindset, growth mindset is a perspective about the nature of humans, is when we see ourselves as able to change ourselves, uh, our abilities or our qualities, right? As malleable, as changeable. And the reason that this is important is that this very specific belief about the nature of humans, not what humans do, like persevere or work hard or being open, but about the nature of humans themselves, lead us to per perceive things differently, to behave in different ways, and therefore to achieve different results. So we'll be unpacking that in a little bit. Um, and sometimes what happens is that we, we see the behaviors not happening, like for example, somebody's not being open-minded, and then we might encourage them to be open-minded. And what growth mindset research shows is that it's really hard for people to be open-minded if they think that people are fixed and static and can't change. So it is the underlying belief that leads to these behaviors. Uh, so growth mindset is when we think that we can change. Like for example, we might see intelligence as something that's static in people. Some people are smart and talented and others are not. And that's a fixed mindset about intelligence. Uh, or we might see intelligence as something that we can all, any of us, further develop. Uh, and that is the growth mindset about intelligence. Or we might see empathy in that way, or public speaking, or reading, or creativity, or lots of other things. And that has deep implications. And one, one reason that this is important is that if we want to improve, we have to change. If we, sometimes we like the idea of improvement, but we don't like the idea of change. But if we are the same today than we were yesterday, then we haven't gotten better. In fact, we probably have gotten a little worse because the world has changed and we haven't. Uh, so the more that we understand that we can change, the more that improvement is possible. The other reason that this is important is, as I mentioned, that this belief, the research shows, leads us to behave differently and to achieve different results. I'm going to quickly unpack uh, what the research shows about that. Uh, but before we do that, and, and we're also going to reflect on when each of us is in a fixed mindset and how that affects us. Because all of us experience a fixed mindset some of the time. That's part of being human. And a really important part of this work is to become more self-aware about when we're in a fixed mindset and what kinds of things we see in a fixed mindset. That's, that's a, a, a fundamental step in this process. But before that, we're going to do the opposite. So imagine that a fixed mindset doesn't exist. 
Imagine that we could change ourselves in any way that we wanted to. If we take that as an assumption for this activity, um, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve, whether it is in your personal life or your professional life? My fitness level, my focus, my ability to relate to people, my presentation, poise, being less talkative, my discipline, my ability to concentrate, my morning routine, my time management, learning more languages, having more patience, organization, So we, I want you to start thinking about which of these things do you tend to see as you go about life on a daily basis? Do you tend to see as fixed in people? Some people are great at this and some aren't and that doesn't change and they develop versus things that are developed over time. That's gonna help us start to, to realize where we tend to be in a fixed mindset. And one second question is, if we librarians as a collective could get better at anything, what should we improve? the empathy for our patrons. Empathy. In this poll, you can actually see what other people have submitted and you can upvote the things that resonate for you as well. Flexibility, connecting with patrons, community engagement, communicating our skills in an easy to understand way, including diverse collections and teams, great. So again, uh, I want you to start thinking about which of these things do you tend to take as a given or do your colleagues tend to take as a given versus as things that we can improve and work at improvement. And we'll come back to these questions later. Um, so I want to unpack this relationship from the research on how this belief, this very specific belief leads us to behave differently and to achieve different results. And to do that, I'm going to uh, describe a very specific set of research studies and I'm going to summarize lots of other research. So in this particular set of research studies, uh, researchers set about studying people's beliefs about intelligence. Uh, they wanted to see, you know, who thought of intelligence like Albert Einstein did, which is something that's malleable and can be developed as a growth mindset. He said things like, it's not that I'm so smart, it's just that I stay with a problem longer, or I have no special talents, I am only passionately curious. Who thought intelligence was malleable or changeable versus who saw it as fixed? Um, and so to do that, the researchers ask people a set of questions like this one. People can learn new things, but they can't really change their basic intelligence. And people would agree strongly or disagree strongly or anywhere in between. And then they put these people into a brain scan machine, a functional MRI machine that looked at their brain in real time as they solved problems inside of the machine. Because the researchers wanted to, they were wondering is if these people's brains work differently depending on whether they thought intelligence was fixed or something that could be developed. And what they found is that it does work differently uh, for people who are in a fixed mindset. Their brain is most attentive and most active when they're getting information during the problem, the problem solving process about whether they got this problem right or wrong. Did I get this right? Did I get this right? Did I get this right? They're paying a lot of attention then. There's a lot of kind of blood flow in the brain at that time uh, versus they're not paying much more attention at all at the time when the people in a growth mindset were paying the most attention, which is when they were getting information about what mistakes they made, uh, what they did wrong. They were paying the most attention at that time. They were also paying attention to whether they get things right or wrong. Uh, but they were paying the most attention when the people in a fixed mindset were paying the least attention. And as a result of that, they achieve better accuracy in the subsequent problems because they learned from their mistakes and they were able to become better problem solvers as a result of that. So they became better problem solvers because they paid attention to their mistakes and they paid attention to their mistakes because they thought that they could become smarter. So it's just an example of how some of this research is done. Uh, to summarize lots of other research, in a fixed mindset, we're thinking, okay, if people are either smart and talented or not, I want to be in the smart and talented category. And the way I go about doing that is by doing things that I already know how to do well, perfectly, without mistakes, without effort. 
Um, I, and, and so I keep doing those things that are in my comfort zone versus in a growth mindset, we can get bored if we're doing the things that we already know how to do over and over again. We want challenges that are interesting to us. They're going to help us improve. In a fixed mindset, we see effort as something that's negative. Only people with low ability need to work hard. People with high ability don't need to work hard. Versus in a growth mindset, we understand that the people who achieve the highest level of competence in any domain work really hard to get there and continue to work really hard to get even better, like Olympic gold medalists. In a fixed mindset, when we experience setbacks or mistakes, uh, we feel helpless. We say, we take that as evidence that our ability is low. So we say, I'm not good at this. I'm going to go do something else. Versus in a growth mindset, we understand that if we're doing things that are challenging, that we haven't mastered yet, we're not going to do them flawlessly. We're going to practice. We're going to persevere. We're going to try different strategies. We're going to ask for help. In a fixed mindset, when we receive feedback or criticism, we act defensively. We say, this is not true, or this person's just trying to hurt me. Versus in a growth mindset, we listen and we ask ourselves, is there some truth here that I can learn from? And when other people succeed in a fixed mindset, we see that as a threat that makes us feel less capable. And in a growth mindset, we tend to see it as a lesson or inspiration. This person is so good at this. What could I learn from them and what could I emulate? And all of these things, um, lead us to uh, be more effective learners, to improve more over time and to achieve higher performance, right? And higher competence. Uh, there's also research that shows how growth and fixed mindset affect personal relationships. We can imagine that how we view other people's success influences how we interact with them and our relationship with them. Another example is when there's wrongdoing, like for example, where you know, at the library and somebody says something passive aggressive to us, uh, in a fixed mindset, we take that negative behavior and we attribute it to fixed traits in the other person, we label them. And so our, as a result, we tend to retaliate and engage in warfare rather than attribute the negative behavior to their current motivations or their current situation, both of which can change. And then having a reaction that's more about dialogue, right? About positive conflict resolution. And finally, when life gets really hard, we see higher rates of depression in a fixed mindset and lower resilience and higher resilience and lower rates of depression in a growth mindset because we understand that we can change and other people can change. Now, there's a lot of information. You don't have to remember all of this. The key to remember here is that when we see our human abilities and qualities as malleable, as changeable, there's a lot of benefits that happen that make us more effective learners and also have better relationships with the people around us. Um, a couple of uh, questions that we get about growth mindset uh, that I want to clarify. One is, can I be in a growth mindset about one thing and in a fixed mindset about something else? And the answer is yes. So for example, we might see reading as something that anybody can learn and further improve. We have a growth mindset about reading. Well, at the same time, we might see creativity as in a fixed way, right? As some people are creative and other people are not creative and that's how it is. Uh, and these things can also change. We might go to a creativity workshop, like a design thinking workshop, and experience a process that helps us be a lot more creative. And that might change our mindset about creativity. Wow, I could actually become a lot more creative if I learn how to do so, right? So similarly, you know, on anything else, we might be in more of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset in either of these areas. And these things change based on the context, based on the people around us, based on the strategies that we're exposed to and resources, et cetera. The other thing is that we might see ourselves in one mindset and the people around us in another. Like we might see ourselves as learners, but label the, our colleagues in fixed ways, right? And that has implications that create self-fulfilling prophecies, whether it is about ourselves or about others. Um, so I'm going to kind of, we're going to uh, do a pair share conversation to reflect on when each of us in a, is in a fixed mindset and how it affects us, because it helps us better understand mindsets, start to increase our own self-awareness and start to understand later how to shift mindsets. Um, so we're going to break out into uh, breakout rooms just for, for four minutes. Uh, we're going to speak one-on-one -on -one with a colleague about this question. When do I tend to be in a fixed mindset and how does that affect me and others? And just stay in your conversation exploring this question until we bring you back into this room. Devin, can you please uh, put us into breakout rooms? Yep, just creating the rooms right Great. now. Thank you. And now they're open. Awesome. See you in a bit.
So everybody should see a button to uh, join a breakout room. If you run into any trouble, just uh, let us know. Unmute yourself and let us know. Devin, so far you can hear me okay? Everything yes. looks fine? Yes. Yeah. Great. Let's see. I'm going to ask you in a few seconds if you can um, just give people a, a one minute heads up. Is sure. that do you, okay? I'll let you know. Thank you. Yep. Hi there. I, I ended up in a breakout room by myself. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, Jody. <laughs> um, Devin, could you put Jody in a, in a group with other people? Is that possible? Yes. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it looks like some people just didn't go into breakout rooms. Apologies about that. Yeah. No worries. Let me. So, what number breakout room are you in? I think I was in 27, something like that. Let's see. Scroll down. Come on, Zoom. And actually, oh, I'm sorry. I was in 10. I'm sorry. That's OK. And you know, because a lot of, uh, it seems like 14 people didn't join a group, let's just give them the one minute uh, warning right now, Devin. If you want, okay. you can put Jody into any breakout room, because if, okay. if it's three people, that's OK. But then we're, we're going to bring you uh, back pretty soon, Jody. Okay. And just think about this question. You know, Think about right. it for yourself. Of right. when do I tend to be in a fixed mindset? Great. Okay, thanks. Sure. And you can also, Jody, and everybody else here start thinking about how you might have developed a fixed mindset about certain things. I'm going to ask you that next. Great. Devin, can you uh, bring people back? Yes. Awesome. Thanks. All right. We see people are starting to come back. We have about 29 people back, 31. Great. So just keep reflecting on this. Uh, when do I tend to be in a fixed mindset and how does that affect me and others? And I encourage you for the next couple of weeks, if you haven't done a lot of work on this before, just to try to keep reflecting on that and try to catch yourself when you're in a fixed mindset and how that's affecting you. Uh, eventually what we want is to be able to catch ourselves on a, on, in the middle of any day, when we're in a fixed mindset, be able to see that happening and become aware of it. Because when we do, that's the first step to, to really understand our thinking and how it's affecting us and then be able to, to change it. Great. Uh, so thanks everybody for uh, the conversation. I hope that you enjoyed the conversation. Sorry to cut it short. I know these can become uh, like really involved conversations. They help us increase our own self-awareness. They help us understand mindsets better. And they also deepen our relationships. Sometimes people become afraid of talking about this and, and they might think that a fixed mindset is taboo. We know we should never be in a fixed mindset. I encourage you to acknowledge fixed mindset, be able to see it and acknowledge it to yourself and to each other so that you, you can talk about it, right? And support one another in this journey. So quick polling question. Um, how might I have developed some fixed mindset beliefs? Let's share with each other. Family values, 
prior successes and failures, how I was raised, wanting to be the best, absolutely. Insecurities, absolutely. Lack of knowledge, absolutely. Someone telling me I could not do something, yes. Stress, absolutely. History, negative self-talk, great. Social expectations, fear of failing. How people praise me, feel of failing, absolutely. Education system, absolutely. From colleagues or supervisors or cultural beliefs or lack of information and insight, absolutely. What's happened in terms of lack of information and knowledge is that often society is not aware of mindsets, right? So we have been hearing fixed mindset and growth mindset messages throughout our whole lives. And it's kind of um, not very clear, right? So we're getting a lot of mixed messages. And then we tend to, as humans, uh, confirm our prior beliefs. So we pay attention to the things that confirm our beliefs and disregard the things that are inconsistent with it. And then whatever mindset we have gets reinforced. I want to do a quick uh, activity on the impact of language and how language can impact our mindset, which is something that a couple of you mentioned. Um, so I'm going to put in front of you a sample se sentence, like a sample statement that we might say in any context. And I want you to think about whether this tends to foster more of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Say for example, if I say, let's work hard, does that foster more of a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? I want you to choose one mentally. So this is what we call ambiguous language. It doesn't foster a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And the reason is that it doesn't make a, it doesn't have a perspective about the nature of human qualities or abilities, which is what mindset is. So if we're in a, if we're in a growth mindset and we hear let's work hard, we might interpret it as let's work hard so that we can get better. You know, that, that keeps us in a growth mindset. But if we're in a fixed mindset and somebody says let's work hard, we might interpret it in a fixed mindset. We might think, okay, I need to work hard because my ability is low or I need to work hard because this task is difficult or a bunch of other questions that doesn't help me change change my perspective about the nature of human abilities and qualities. So whenever we portray abilities as fixed, uh, it puts people in a fixed mindset. Whenever we portray abilities as malleable, it helps them get into a growth mindset. And we, when we do neither, then it doesn't make any change in the mindset of other people or in ourselves. So let's do a couple of more. Let's work hard is ambiguous language. How about let's work hard so that we can improve? What do you think? Growth mindset, fixed mindset, or ambiguous? So here we're saying, so we can improve. We're being very clear that uh, this is growth mindset. It's not possible to interpret that in a fixed mindset. How about, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. This would be another example of ambiguous language, right? Because um, if we're in a growth mindset, we might interpret that, or in a fixed mindset, we might interpret it as meaning that we have the ability to do it already. Uh, if we're in a growth mindset, we might also interpret it as, if I don't know how to do it, I can figure it out. But if we're in a fixed mindset, we might think, okay, I already have the ability, or this person thinks I have the ability, but I don't really, or they're just saying that to be nice, or a bunch of other things, right? Uh, I know you can learn it. It's an example of a growth mindset. We're being explicit that we can learn, right? We can increase our understanding. You're so smart. So let's say somebody does something well, we praise them, you're so smart. This tends to people, put people in a fixed mindset because there's such a prevalent understanding of intelligence as fixed in society. And because we tend to say this after people do something well, and especially if they do it quickly and without effort. And so when we say that, then people learn that the, way, the reason people succeed is because they're smart, is something that they are. And it's not because of their behavior, and that puts them into a fixed mindset. It is smart is something that we could work to uh, redefine as something that we can always improve. Um, and so we could, this could be an ambiguous statement, but it, there's such a prevalent understanding of intelligence as fixed in society that it tends to put people in a fixed mindset. And how about when, when others are working hard but not making progress, and we say, I appreciate the effort. I appreciate that you're working hard. Keep working hard. Growth mindset, fixed mindset, ambiguous. So this depends a little bit on the relationship and the context, but I would say that in general it's ambiguous because if 
if people are doing things that are not working, that are not leading to improvement, then uh, if we say keep doing what you're doing, we're not really believing that they can improve because in order for them to improve, they're going to need to do work to work differently, right? What keep continuing to do what they're already doing is not going to change the results. So if we really believe that they can get better and improve, we have to help them figure out what else can you do, you know, help them reflect on changing things. Uh, so messages in general that foster a fixed mindset is when we label other people in fixed ways or when we talk about who has the potential or who doesn't have the potential. Like potential is not something that's fixed inside of us. It's something that we develop along the way. Uh, or when we don't support learning, we're really communicating that we don't really believe that people can learn and improve, right? Versus messages that support a growth mindset is when we comment or work on people's behaviors, their choices, the things that they can control rather than labeling them. Uh, so when we portray abilities as malleable, as we saw, when we're focused on improvement over time rather than comparing people to each other, which tends to be put people in a fixed mindset. When we talk about behavior, strategies, choices, when we're valuing, taking on challenges, things we haven't done before and learning from those things to get better. When we're soliciting feedback that we can learn from other people and, and we're, we're asking for that feedback, as well as giving constructive feedback when we're talking about surprises and mistakes to learn, not just saying mistakes are fine and we, we need to move on, but actually thinking about it so we can learn from them, right? So we can figure out what do we do differently next time? And uh, when, we, when we put into place systems and habits that support improvement, and we'll be talking about that more. So a couple of quick things on the question of, is a growth mindset actually true, right? Can people actually become smarter? I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because I want us to get into a conversation, and have time at the end for a bit of a conversation. Um, but there's neuroscience research that shows that we can improve our ability to think. Like for example, uh, among London taxi drivers, when they become taxi drivers, they have to get certified. Their brain, the, the part of the brain called the hippocampus becomes bigger and denser once they learn these 25,000 streets in a city that's not a grid. Uh, so they, it helps them and they don't use a GPS if, you're, if, they're, if they are um, driving on a black cab. So they become smarter, they're able to retrieve memory uh, better, they're able to think spatially better because of the training that they do in order to become a taxi driver. Similarly, if you look at the brains of animals in stimulating environments, they are denser and heavier than the brains of uh, animals that are in boring environments where they're not thinking very much. Um, and there are studies of world-class performers that find there's no early indicators of extraordinary performance. Like for example, IQ is not a predictor of extraordinary performance. Uh, what does matter is the amount, but also the quality of practice. You know, how we go about practice and how we go about improvement. And we'll be unpacking that in a little bit. And the other thing that this research has found is something else that makes a big difference is sleep. The people who achieve the highest level of expertise in their domains sleep more than other people. And a couple of reasons for that. One is that deliberate practice involves full concentration at a high challenge level uh, beyond what we can already do. That involves a lot of concentration. It's tiring. So we need more rest. And the other reason is that when we get a full night's sleep, we learn. Our brain is learning. It is disconnecting neurons that shouldn't be connected. It's connecting other neurons that should be connected. It's also removing toxins from the brain. So, so sleep, a full night's sleep, is a very effective learning strategy to consolidate things into long-term memory. So a couple, of, um, a couple of key benefits of growth mindset from the research base, just as a summary, a growth mindset leads to more ambitious goals and challenges. I've talked a bit about that. To greater growth performance and resilience. I've talked a bit about that to more positive and collaborative relationships. I've talked a little bit about that. Also, it leads to greater equity, diversity, and inclusion. When we believe that people can improve and that anyone can improve, one of the psychological consequences of that is that we are less affected by negative stereotypes. So people of color, uh, uh, women or girls in math and science, there are non-conscious stereotypes about those people being less capable in those domains, uh, which are not true, but which affect us. And so when we think of people as malleable, those stereotypes affect us less and there's a greater uh, equity, there's greater uh, equal opportunity for everybody to contribute, and there's also greater voice, so there's very greater inclusion. So if you have a more diverse environment where people feel more, more willing to speak up, 
that contributes to greater creativity and innovation. So we see that as well, as well as people generally are taking more risks and doing things they haven't done before, which leads to creativity and innovation. There's also more ethical behavior when we're in a fixed mindset, we tend to lie more and we tend to cut corners more. And, um, and something, these are all things that have been shown in research, something that hasn't been shown in research, but I, I deeply believe is that when we're in a growth mindset, it also leads to greater happiness and fulfillment. You know, it just makes life more interesting uh, and it makes us uh, enjoy life more and, and go through it as an exploration, right? Uh, something that can be more interesting. So uh, because of all these benefits, there's been a lot of in growth in interest in growth mindset, especially over the last five years. These are the Google searches for growth mindset uh, over 10 years. Uh, compared to any kind of control term, I chose the term positive mindset. You see a peak every September, that's the beginning of the school year, teachers and students are learning about growth mindset to set themselves up for success for the coming academic year. And because of all those uh, benefits that I just talked about, lots of companies have decided to make growth mindset a key strategic part of their culture. And these are just some of the examples. Um, so what can we do? So we talked about what growth mindset is and what, how it affects us psychologically and what some of the benefits are. So how can we take action? Um, so three things that we can do, whether with ourselves and with our colleagues in our environments and our libraries is first, create a shared vision of the culture that we want among our colleagues, right? A culture of learning. And we'll, we'll talk more about this. Second, cultivate the systems and habits for learning. How do we want people to actually improve over time? And are those systems and habits in place? And finally, model learning, uh, because our actions speak louder than our words. And so I'm going to share uh, an, a second framework which is going to help us do these three things at the same time. And to do that, I'm going to go out of our context as librarians. We're going to look at a group of performers who are fantastic at what they do and, and examine an idea, and then we'll bring it back to our context. This group of very high performers are Cirque du Soleil. I love watching them. They are fantastic at what they do. They do these incredible acrobatic things and they do them beautifully and artistically. But something that creates a bit of a conflict for me is that they very seldom make mistakes. They are pretty flawless. And that's a little bit of a conflict for me because I'm saying that in a growth mindset, we want to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes. So how can I reconcile that I, I really admire the level of excellence of Cirque du Soleil, but yet they're not making mistakes and learning from them. And what we often don't have top of mind is that the reason that Cirque du Soleil is so good at what they do is that they spend a lot of time doing something very different from what we see on stage when they are behind curtains at the gym or at the studio, they are very often making mistakes, dropping the ball, missing the timing, because they're working on the next level of challenge, what they haven't mastered yet. And it is the time that they spend on the left, what we call the learning zone, which allows them to excel on the right in the performance zone when they're in, on stage in front of us. Same thing in sports, right? If we're playing a championship final and we're having trouble with a particular move, we're going to avoid that move in that, in that final if we can, because we're trying to win the game. But then after the game, we're going to go to our coach and say, coach, I'm having trouble with this particular move. Let's work on that. And that's a very different activity and very different level of focus and attention than what we do during the match. So what often happens at work is that we spend all of our time on the right, on the performance zone, just trying to do things well, trying to minimize mistakes, trying to be flawless, and that leads to stagnation. Uh, so Roger Federer, one of the greatest tennis players of all time, was once being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, December was crucial for me. I don't want to say this in a cocky way, but I believe I worked the hardest from the top eight players in the offseason. Many guys went off to play exhibitions or wearing the Davis Cup, but if they were on the right in the performance zone, I had time, I put my head down and worked. He worked in a very different way. He worked on the improvement, not on performance. So the greatest performers, the greatest, most competent people alternate between these two zones. They perform and then they reflect and think about what went well, what didn't go well, what could I do differently next time? What do I need to practice? And then they go back to performance and, and they, they spend time in the learning zone improving and then they go back to performance, right? And in the workplace, these are things that sometimes we can do at the same time, you know, as we go about the work. The key is that in order to improve, we must be deliberate about improvement. Just work, ju the improvement doesn't happen magically just by working hard at doing the job. We have to actually be deliberate about improvement in order to improve. 
Um, what often happens is we're so busy doing the work, which in this slide is just represented by pushing the cart, that we don't stop and think, how can I work smarter? How can I work better, right? So when I asked you earlier, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve? Uh, whatever you wrote down, I want you to think about, do I regularly engage in the learning zone when it comes to this, right? Like if, you, if it's time management, are you doing anything to improve in your time management? Are you reading books about it? Are you watching videos? Are you trying new strategies? Are you trying new tools, right? Uh, doing things that you haven't done before, uh, being more patient or whatever it is, right? Or similarly, if we librarians as a collective could get better at anything, what should we improve? Do you with your colleagues work on these things? Then are you being deliberate about improving on those things? And what could you do better? Because uh, often what happens is that we get better when we're novices because we're so bad that we don't need great learning strategies in order to improve. But then we start, start stagnating because we're not engaging in the learning zone. And we then take that as evidence of a fixed mindset that we can't improve because we're working hard and we're not getting better. So that must mean that we can't get better. But in reality, we're not engaging in effective learning strategies to continue to get better. Uh, so I'm going to show a couple of learning strategies like in the workplace for you to think about. I want you to think about which, uh, which ones of these are you doing well and are there one or two that you could do better, more regularly? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Great, are there one or two things that you could be doing more or better to engage in the learning zone on a regular basis? So let's take a poll. As related to my professional growth, to what extent do I engage in the learning zone? So we're seeing about kind of 6% of us feel, I feel good about, I'm effectively engaging in learning zone to a great extent. 0% uh, of us are in the bottom. I don't think engaging in learning zone would be useful for me. And then the rest, you know, 90, 94% are somewhere in the middle, right? I, I either could significantly improve in my engagement in learning zone, or I'm pretty good at it, but I could improve further. And which are very kind of growth minded views, right? In a growth mindset, we can always continue to improve. Now, I do want you to notice that last option, right? I don't think engaging in learning zone would be useful for me. Um, it's, it's helpful to understand that everybody, in this case, right, but very often, that's what I find, everybody, if not virtually everybody, um, uh, values the learning zone, thinks it's a good thing. And the reason that it's important to notice that is that it creates the, it, 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 it makes us realize that we have a common goal, right? We, we either, are doing this great and we want to continue doing it or we want to do it more. And so we're aligned with our colleagues if we all understand what it is we want to be doing. And it also creates safety so that we can do it with each other. Uh, so one, one more question on this, as librarians, to what extent do we engage in the learning zone together? So again, we see a lot of opportunity for improvement on engaging in the learning zone with our colleagues and, uh, and with, with our, our fellow librarians, which is exciting. You know, it's an opportunity for us to work on this and talk about it and see what we can do together to, to, to improve our improvement. Uh, I want to point out something about the learning zone, the performance zone. That's that in the learning zone, if we're working on what we don't know, what we haven't mastered yet, we have to expect to make mistakes. 
And as a result of that, in order to engage in the learning zone, we have to be in a low stakes situation. The consequence of making mistakes must not be very material. So as an example, a tightrope walker in Cirque du Soleil is not going to try new skills without a net underneath because if there's no net, they're going to fall if they're doing things they haven't mastered yet and they're gonna get hurt. And sometimes at work, people feel more like this, right? Like if they take risks and they fall, they're gonna get hurt in some way. Either people are gonna think less of them or, or something else. And if that's the case, then people are just gonna be in the performance zone all the time. And so we need to think about ways to create safety one way to think that about that is to create safety islands, right? What are the times and spaces or the groups of people where we want to be taking on challenges? We want to be trying new things that we haven't mastered yet. You know, what are those times and spaces? And we can also think about potentially creating safety, safe waters so that no matter when we make mistakes, when no matter when we're not flawless, uh, we can talk about it. We can say, hey, this didn't go as we planned you know, let's talk about what, what we can learn from it so we can do something differently next time, right? And three ways to create that safety is one, to work on creating a vivid shared vision of the culture we want to build and how we want to work with each other and how we want to engage in the learning zone with each other. Second, the systems and habits for improvement. What are the things we want to be doing to improve? And are those systems and habits in place, whether individual or collective habits and systems? And finally, modeling learning and modeling learning is really important because through your actions other people learn about your beliefs whether you believe that abilities are truly malleable and are acting on those beliefs whether growing our abilities in, is important and safe in this library and in this organization and how we go about improvement what are the ways that we can effectively engage in the learning zone here so we need to not just talk about this as being important but we need to uh, show it visibly and explicitly in front of the people that we lead and in front of our colleagues. Because if we don't, they're going to see us as know-it-alls. And no matter what we say, our actions are going to speak louder than our words. So when I asked you earlier, how do I want my colleagues to perceive me and to think of me? You, you, you wrote down here wonderful things, right? A lot of, most of these things are not about them perceiving you as a learner, as a work in progress, right? So listener is great, like being a good listener is part of learning. That's an example of being wanting to be perceived as a learner, but it's competent, helpful, hardworking, kind, good at what I do, fair, kind, creative, you know, competent, smart, you know, leader, all approachable, all these things are wonderful things. I don't want you to remove those things. But I want you to reflect on whether you also want to be perceived as a learner, as a lifelong learner, as a work in progress. Because if you, if you don't have top of mind day as a goal, as something you want other people to perceive you as, it's going to be really hard to create a learning oriented culture uh, if we're not all trying to do that explicitly and deliberately. Um, so think about uh, which of these things do you do on a regular basis? And are there one or two things that you would like to do more often in order to more visibly uh, model being a learner? I'll give you a few moments to think about that. Great, so we're gonna do one more poll. Well, so first, so, so it's really important to start with a self. Often when we talk about growth mindset and fixed mindset, we have a tendency to want to change other people. You know, this person uh, has a fixed mindset, it's often my, my spouse that we think about, <laughs> um, or our colleagues or whoever, our boss. Uh, but it's really important to look within ourselves and think about, am I modeling visibly and explicitly being a learner in front of other people, right? Um, and, and so we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more poll question that we're gonna open it for discussion in the Q&A. And then after the Q&A, I'm gonna share a couple of key takeaways. 
Uh, but let's do one more poll before we get to the Q&A. Considering everything we've explored, what could we do as librarians to further cultivate a growth mindset culture in our organizations? And again, you can upvote the things that resonate for your reading. Haha, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, celebrate failing forward, wonderful. Normalize mistakes, make them normal. Make the challenge seeking and the experimentation normal and encourage so that we're making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and trying new things. Absolutely. Encouraging risk, absolutely. Leading by example. Being ashamed of not having an answer sometimes, not being know-it-alls, right? Modeling no knowing and being able to learn from other people. Sharing this webinar so that more people understand what it is, great. Awesome. So let's open it up for conversation, uh, either kind of insights that you have had throughout this session or ideas that you have for what you might do or what ideas, questions that you have for each other or questions that you have for me. So um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask any questions that you would like or share any ideas or insights. Yeah, so you're welcome to share in the chat. Um, Laura just raised her hand. So if you wanna respond in the chat or unmute, either way. Yes, um, thank you very much, Eduardo. This is like, the session is like so awesome. I'm really enjoying everything. Um, one of the slides that you showed had um, uh, performance and experience and then there was this line and I don't remember exactly what you were saying during that slide but I just I was like oh the plateau that's that's where I'm at burnout like I just like immediately thought of the word burnout so I don't know if like um, if that's like something um, that that happens in this growth mindset fixed mindset thing or could you speak to that absolutely thank you Laura for that and yeah I'm sorry I went through the presentation pre quickly because there were important things that I wanted us to share and I wanted to get to this conversation. So I hope I didn't go too quickly, but uh, there's a very clear connection between growth mindset and resilience, right? When we are in a growth mindset, we're a lot more resilient because when we're going through challenges, we understand that those challenges are not permanent. We can learn and we can learn how to better, better deal with them. That, that connects to the crisis and the moment that we're going through, right? Um, but, but also because ch change and challenge is part of life is what we want, right? We want to be trying new things. Uh, that makes things more interesting. It, it makes it less about our identity and, and it makes the stakes less... Uh, kind of a big weight on our shoulder that, you know, here are a bunch of challenges that I'll never be able to, uh, to learn or that, uh, that I should know all these answers and I shouldn't be struggling. Uh, so absolutely, the, a fix, in a fix, when we're in a fixed mindset, it, it can make us, the, the challenges and the change feels like a lot more weight on our shoulders that can lead to more exhaustion and more burnout. I absolutely agree with that. And also when we're in a growth mindset, we are, work is more interesting because we're developing ourselves, right? So we're asking more questions, we're exploring, and that makes work more interesting, which also helps us not burn out, right? Because we're always changing things. We're not just kind of going through the grind of working hard to execute and which is less interesting. Thank you for your question. We have a question from Corinne. Um, I just switched from the circulation department where I worked for three years to reference. Many of the habits that, I, that once served me well don't serve me in this new role as a reference librarian. How can I respect my old processes while cultivating openness to new ways of thinking? Great. Um, so, I'm not sure what you mean by how can I respect my old process. I would ask if your old process works for you well now, that's great. You know, I would keep doing that. Um, or another way to think about it is, but if it's not right, if it's not working well, then think about how can I improve, whether it's in that process or other things. I think one thing I would say is that um, it, it is not generally not effective to try to work at 
improving everything or improving lots of things at the same time, right? Uh, it's, it's more effective to think about what is, what is the one thing, you know, or like two or three things, but ideally what's the one thing that I want to be proactive about improving at this moment in time. That's important to me, that's gonna make a difference. And so we identify what that is, whether it is a process or something else, and then you can be proactive about improving that, right? About learning what do experts in this thing, you know, what are different things that I could uh, try in terms of processes or approaches or tools or other things. We, I, we could ask for ideas for our colleagues, whether they're in our organization or outside our organization. We can simply experiment and try new things and how they work. So that kind of proactive of what do I think is important to improve and how do I go about it is something that I would encourage you to think about. And then we can also be open to reactive growth, which is sometimes we go about life and we're surprised, right? We do something that, that hurts somebody else without intending it to, whether it is one of the patrons or one of our colleagues or one of our family members or friends. And we kind of ask questions. We say, oh my God, you mean to do that? Like what, you know, what happened? Tell me more. Like, and what could I do differently next time? Right. So we can, we can listen and look for surprises and mistakes that we make and learn from those things in a reactive way. And then we can be strategic and proactive about ideally one thing. And so I would ask you to think about what that thing is, whether it's your process or something else. But the idea is that we're always improving, right? We're always trying something new in the area that's important to us. And change is, is the constant. We know that makes life more interesting. It makes us more competent over time. I see we have a question for Garrett, from yeah. Garrett. So Garrett's question is, how do you contrast the idea of a growth mindset and finding your strengths and aligning your responsibilities with your strengths. To what degree should I pursue development in areas which may not be natural strengths um, when a growth mindset seems to suggest that I can grow in any area? Great. Um, so we can think about strengths and weaknesses either in a fixed mindset or in a growth mindset, right? We can think about strengths as here are my strengths because they're hardwired in me. Like I can't improve them further and I haven't gotten better at them over time. And that's just how I am. I'm, I'm good at these things. I'm bad at these things. That's a fixed mindset about strengths and weaknesses. Or we can see strengths and weaknesses in a growth mindset as something that we can further improve our strengths and we can further improve our weaknesses. And so the choice of what we, cho what we choose to work on, whether it is a strength or a weakness, is, is a choice of judgment. It's similar to what, what I just said of like, we shouldn't be working on everything. We should be strategic and choose what it is that we want to work on. Sometimes it makes sense to say, okay, I want to continue focusing on this strength or these few strengths, and I want to continue getting better at those things because the weaknesses are not that important or like my colleagues compliment me well, so we're working well as a team. I don't have to get better at those things. And sometimes the weaknesses get really in the way, right? Like often if somebody's really bad at listening, that's going to be really hard for that person to be affected you know, it doesn't matter if it's a weakness, like it is probably something that at some point you should work to improve because it's really getting in the way. So I would ask yourself, you know, I'm going to work on something, you know, should it be a strength or a weakness? I think there's a judgment call to think about what's most important for you to continue to improve. We have a question from Leslie. Um, I see that normalized mistakes has gotten the most votes. What's an effective way of changing the culture from thinking mistakes are okay? and stopping there to using mistakes as part of the learning process. Um, I often hear it's okay, we can fix that without a desire to improve the situation so that the same mistakes don't continue to occur. Yeah, uh, great question. Because uh, you know, people with the best intention say, we wanna make things safer, let's just say mistakes are okay and we'll just disregard them. But that's not really that useful, right? We're not valuing mistakes and making the most of them to learn from them. So one thing that you can try uh, that is very effective is you can do uh, kind of debriefs uh, after something happens, um, or you might call them a post-mortem, um, where something happens and it just becomes normalized to say, 
let's let's gather especially after people if it's something big that people are really stressed out and like freaked out about you might want to wait a few days and then get together to do a post-mortem and that's just a reflection on okay like this didn't go as we would have hoped you know what what didn't go well and what can we learn from this and what can we do differently next time so that's a a lot of organizations do that as a normal process you know that is part of the way they work when things don't work well, they have a meeting to talk about it. It's not about placing blame. It's not about whose fault it is. It's about what can we learn from this and what can we do differently next time. Uh, another thing to consider is leading by example. So uh, talking about what mistakes you have made or a mistake that you have recently made and what you learned from it. Uh, if you want to make that part of a regular meeting, like a regular conversation, say for example, you have a weekly meeting with your colleagues uh, and an easy way to change the conversation is to change the agenda. So you might put in the agenda a learning oriented topic like what questions do we have for each other or you know how can we work more effectively or what mistakes have we made recently and what can we learn from them or what are you trying to improve or what have you learned recently. So if you change the agenda it's going to change the conversation. So those are some of the strategies. Um, yeah. Should we go to Leslie's question or somebody else's question? So that was Leslie's question. Oh, okay. So, yeah, if, um, if folks have more questions, please respond in the chat or raise your hand um, and let us know. Great, so uh, if there are no more questions and you can, you can raise your hand still, uh, and ask a question, but in the meantime, I'm going to ask you a question as we go into key takeaways. I want to continue the conversation for a few more minutes, okay? Um, but um, but as we get started in the takeaways, that I want to share a couple of key takeaways. Uh, I want to start with the most important key takeaway, and that is for us to pause and to think about what was the most valuable insight or takeaway for me today. So let's think about what that is for each of us. Write it down. Uh, so that we can learn from each other. And then if you do have a question, do unmute yourself and ask. And also, if you want to expand on an insight, you know, we can learn from each other on, on these insights. Insights are weak connections in the brain. So if we talk about them, we strengthen them, we're more likely to remember them. Great, so a couple of insights, clarity on what growth mindset is, the notion of normalizing mistakes, Balance the time in the learning zone with the performance zone. Learning zone activities that I could implement. Great, using growth mindset language. Take it, taking it one goal at a time. I'm not a lost cause. Yeah, growth mindset gives us hope based on science and a strategy, right? Avoid labeling others as fixed mindset, great. Rest and sleep as a learning strategy. Potential might be a hidden limitation. Model learning, be seen by others as a learner. Awesome. Change is always possible, absolutely. Mistakes are part of learning. Talk about areas that I'm interested in learning about. Share that with my colleagues because then they can help us get better, right? They can help us give feedback on those areas over time. And not only are we modeling being learners too. Intelligence is malleable. Intention, sleep and practice. Awesome. Does anyone want to share either by voice either an insight that you had or an idea of what librarians could do to act upon these insights okay people don't want to share that fine great so laura awesome. yeah um, I, we're actually at a, at a point at my library where we're doing goal setting. And so um, <laughs> uh, they're due on Monday. So I really have to rethink um, how I've formulated those goals for myself. And I'll certainly be sharing uh, this webinar with 
with my dean. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of implications here for, um, for goal setting. Great. Thank you, Laura. And um, do you want to share a little bit more about what might be an implication for goal setting or what you're thinking, how, what, how you think you might adjust, you know, starting that thinking process? Yeah, I think I think a little bit of um, how my goals are really um, outcome based and not like I, I'm going to like I'm going to finish this project and I'm going to serve on this committee. Um, and now I'm like, oh, maybe it's I want to improve. <laughs> I mean, may, maybe this should have been like, you know, a no brainer, but um, I was not I was not formulating these from as, as you know with a growth mindset with you know thinking about myself as a learner and like what to improve it was very and, and like that's how I've been doing goal setting all this time is just okay I've done this thing and I've done this thing and I've done this thing and it just seems like that's a very like performance-based um, goal and so I'm rethinking now like what what are skills that I want to improve I don't know if that, that makes more sense Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's very common for organizations to be kind of stuck into like performance oriented goals only. There's nothing wrong with performance oriented goals, right? What, are, what do we want to accomplish in the next three months or in the next year? But are you also including improvement oriented goals like you're saying, right? So we should have performance goals and improvement goals. And ideally, if we want a learning culture, each person should have some learning goals and share it with their colleagues because that way we can help each other get better on the things that are of interest to us. And I encourage for that to be a choice that gives people autonomy, right? So that they can choose what they wanna work on. They can have feedback and ideas and input from other people, including their boss and their peers. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, w w if they choose it, it's a lot more powerful, whether it's a strength or a weakness like we talked about before. Uh, so absolutely, similarly in, in the performance uh, conversations, right? When you are, you, you are giving feedback to somebody on how well they're doing, uh, there should be conversations about performance, but also conversation about learning, right? What did you say you wanted to get better at? What strategies did you use? How did that work? Have you actually gotten better at those things? And giving feedback about that and like, what are you going to be working on next? You know, how are you going to go about doing that? How can I support you? So talking about those two things, performance goals and learning goals, just like you said. Thank you for sharing that. Um, does it, one other person want to share an insight or an idea? All right, so I want to share a couple of quick insights and then I'm going to ask you for feedback on this session to support my learning zone. So one thing that I would highlight is that a growth mindset is not being open minded is not working hard is the belief that human abilities and qualities are malleable. This underlying belief leads us to take on learning oriented behaviors. If you want to learn more about this, the seminal book on it is Mindset by Carol Dweck. Uh, I co-founded Mindset Works with Carol Dweck 13 years ago and have had her as a mentor, being very fortunate for that. It's a wonderful book. Uh, we also talked about the learning zone and the performance zone. And the key takeaway here is that in order to improve, we must be deliberate about improvement. Just working hard at execution is not effective to improve. It leads to stagnation. And finally, in order to create safety and to create a learning oriented culture, consider painting a vivid vision of the culture that you want to have, how you want, what you want people to talk about, what you want people to do, uh, to consider the systems and habits for learning, whether individual or team-based, and consider whether you're explicitly and visibly modeling learning in front of other people and not just talking about it. Finally, I want to uh, ask for your support in my learning zone. I'm going to ask you for your feedback. So I'm gonna ask you three questions. The first one is how well this session worked for you. Then I'm gonna ask you what was most helpful. And then I'm gonna ask you for what could I do differently next time? What could I do better? So here's the first question. How would I rate this session? How well did this session work for you? So this helps me kind of calibrate the critical feedback that I'm also requesting, right? Uh, <laughs> Laura is putting good there, great. Um, uh, that's awesome, I, don't, I actually don't know how to do that in Zoom, so I'm gonna be looking that up uh, later. Thank you for giving me something to work on. Um, but I'm glad that this is a good use of your time. I, I know you're busy, so that's great. 
uh, what section of today's session did I get the most out of? This helps me understand what people find helpful so that we can get more out of it, right? The chart of growth mindset versus fixed mindset, the stories, the learning zone and performance zone section, the modeling of learning, using specific language. Great. Great, thank you. Opportunity for interaction with the information. By the way, I saw that one of you asked you what what asked me what technology I was using for the polling. It's called Poll Everywhere, uh, and I think it's very it's a very helpful learning tool in my opinion. I'm glad you liked it. The importance of sleep. Great. And finally, what suggestions for improvement do I have? What could I do better next time in a similar situation? Having handouts, great. More anecdotes or examples, great. References, when you get the slides, you'll see the research references at the bottom of each slide, although we didn't go through a lot, through a lot of uh, specific studies today. Bibliography, great. Um, make this discussions room three or four people so that there are no empty rooms. Yeah, that's a great lesson, thank you for that. Uh, we didn't realize people wouldn't join the rooms, but that's, that's a very helpful uh, key takeaway, thank you. Um, let's see, we took a pre-work. Well, so keep keep sending this feedback. Um, I, uh, I learned a lot from it, it helps me get better. So thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, and I also asked you earlier, what was the most valuable insider takeaway for me? And I learned from that as well, right? I wanna keep doing those things that are, are likely to lead to the insights that you're finding to be helpful. So I'll leave you with three questions. What did I learn today? When new, new insights and new learning are weak connections in the brain because they're new. And, and as we, we forget like 70 or 80% of those new insights and learning, right? We know that, but we think we're not going, when, 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 we, when the learning is powerful, we think we're not going to forget it. That's one of our human biases. We think we're gonna remember more than we actually remember. So in order to make those weak connections stronger, we have to keep thinking about it. Writing it down is really helpful. Coming back to it tomorrow, next week, the following week, you know, if we do what's called space repetition and coming back to that over time, then we strengthen those neural connections and eventually it goes, it turns into long-term memory and things that we know, you know, in the long term. So what did I learn today? Second, what will I and we do? And when will we do it? You know, what is it that, what action am I going to take? And finally, who will I and we become? In a growth mindset, we never stop becoming. And that is not, I think, something that we need to resign ourselves to. It's something that enriches our lives. So thank you again for the important work that you do. Uh, I, I really enjoyed our exploration. And I'll, I'll be, we'll be sending the slides, a PDF of the slides. And if there's anything else that would be helpful, just let Devin know and, and she knows how to reach out to me. Happy to support you in your important work. Thanks again for your time today. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Sure. And for anybody who is um, interested in growth mindset training for their institution in the coming months, um, always know you can reach out to me for Eduardo's email, or he has his email, I think, listed on this slide as well. So um, always know that he's a point of contact for this. Absolutely. Thank you, Devin. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye.